All right, everybody, welcome to the last class session we have on writing. It's going to be about editing. Um, we'll cover why you edit so you can appreciate how to edit. We'll talk about how to edit every document, everything from an email to your boss to the report that your job depends on. <clears throat> we'll talk about different editing tools that you'll be using and other editing tips. Okay, why do you need to edit? Um, it comes down to one really great statement. There is no good writing, just good rewriting. This has been attributed to many people. Uh, the most common source I find is Justice Louis Brandeis, who was a U.S. Supreme Court justice. Um, I'm not sure who really said it in the end, but it doesn't matter because the insight is phenomenal. It basically says that the first time you write something, it's not very good. But the second time you write it, it might be better. The third time, it's probably better. The fourth time, it's almost certainly better. And so if it's about rewriting, um, there's crafting involved. And because there's crafting involved, it makes me think of design stuff. And we spent time learning about the, the way designers think. So let's apply design thinking to rewriting. Um, one of the first observations to make is that in the design world, there's something called iterative design. So iterative design involves refining a product through successive versions each one being better than the last. So you make a widget and then the next version of the widget is better and so on until you have the absolute best widget you've ever made. You know, design, iterative design has influenced all the products we have. Think about cell phones. Right now you have a phone that fits in your pocket. Well, they used to be the size of a large brick. You know, your cell phone can last maybe a couple days on its battery, whereas before they lasted 30 minutes. We started off with cell phones and then we gradually over time made them better. Writing is a lot like that. You can't write the great thing the first time, but you probably can write it well the fifth or sixth time you're rewriting it. Um, somebody who illustrates this concept really well is a guy named Tom Wujek, who works for Autodesk. They have 2D and 3D design software for engineers. And what's really cool about his little project is he has this thing called the challenge, and he trains people on design principles and teamwork. And he does it through this. So essentially you have a short amount of time, a certain number of minutes, in which to build a tower out of spaghetti tape string and on top of the tower you have to balance a marshmallow. And whichever tower is the tallest that can hold up a marshmallow successfully is the one that wins. And he's done this activity with business executives and business students and even with kindergarten students. And he saw some interesting patterns over time. What he noticed about business people is that they approach the problem very deliberately and uniformly. They orient themselves to the issue, learn what their materials are, and then they sit and plan, and they actually plan for a really long time. They discuss different strategies that they might undertake as though they only have one shot at it. And that's and that ends up being self-fulfilling because they build it once as the time is running out. Usually they underestimate the time it takes to build it. And then with a lot of trepidation, they put the marshmallow on the top. And the reality is that most business people that do this task fail at it because they don't even have a tower that can support a marshmallow at all. Um, kindergarten students approach it differently. Of course, they still orient themselves to the task and they stu still do a little bit of planning, but they don't over plan. They just jump in. They start, they start building a tower and something breaks. And so they change it and make it different. And, and, and then something breaks and they change it and make it different. And then they sort of build versions of the tower until the time runs out. And the final version of their tower isn't half bad. In fact, it's more than twice as good as the tower built by the business school students. Um, you'll notice there's the average, which is about 20 inches. Business school students are closer to 11, whereas kindergartners are closer to 26 inches tall. In fact, the only group out there that you'll notice does a better job than kindergartners is architects and engineers, which is really funny, right? But at the same time, of course, architects should do a better job of building towers. That's what they're trained to do. But it's hilarious that kindergartners do a better job than business students, lawyers, or CEOs. And they do a better job because of this iterative process, because they just start building. And then as they build, they make it better and better and better. They improve as they go. Iterative writing is a lot like iterative design, meaning that you know you have to put stuff on paper to make it better, first of all, but that there's this process of refinement where you take out the stuff that doesn't work and you make other stuff better. Um, let me illustrate it in another way. Um, one of the things I would love to do someday is open a donut shop. In fact, if you ask me, I'll talk your ear off about all the different ideas I have for different kinds of donuts that nobody's ever made before. 
Um, that's beside the point, though. If I have this idea for a whiz bang donut, you know, that has all of the sprinkles and the amazing frosting and so on, and I set off to to create that awesome donut, odds are I'm not going to succeed. In fact, the research shows I won't succeed, and the reason is because I'm spending too much time thinking about frosting and sprinkles. What I ought to focus on instead is getting the donut right. In, in entrepreneurship circles, this is called a minimum viable product. This would be my MVP in this case. Um, it, the minimum viable product is sort of your big idea, but stripped down. You take out all the excess features. You take out all the extra uh, effort, and you simplify it to the, to the most basic product you can get away with. Um, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that Krispy Kreme kind of took over the donut world with a simple glazed donut. They got the donut right, and then from that point on, it's just all frosting and sprinkles. But they got the donut right, and that's the, that's the most important part of it is the donut itself, not the frosting and sprinkles. And, you know, writing is a lot like that. Sometimes when we write, we focus on frosting and sprinkles. We focus on putting way too much in rather than the core message itself. You guys have seen this excerpt before. This is what we edited together in class. And you'll notice that what's on the right-hand side, the improved version, is a lot better because it gets the donut right. The, the core message is, hey, reach out to us. We have this open door forum thing. That's totally buried in the left-hand side, and it just shines and comes out in the right-hand side. Now, if you want to add sprinkles, like the fact that this is all about your organization being more responsive, you can talk about that later. But get the donut right before you add sprinkles, and that's what we have to do in our writing. We have to figure out what's the core message, the donut. Once we have that nailed and have that well written, then we can start adding sprinkles. Okay. Let's talk about how to edit every document, like I said, everything from emails to the report that your job depends on. Start off by emphasizing this point. Good editing is focused. If you're going to edit, you need to be editing some particular aspect of the document. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, could you edit this for me? Your first question is, what do you want me to edit? And then they say, well, I want you to edit this document. And then you say, what do you want me to edit? The point is, you need to ask them what about the document do they want edited? There are four ways to edit a document, and, and these are from the book, just altered and, and, and reordered in the way I think is, is better. Um, you're always first going to edit for content. What is the core message and is it working? Then you'll edit for organization. You know, Are you letting the reader know where, the, where you are and where you're going? Finally, next, you edit for readability, which has to do with clarity and freedom from error. And then finally, you edit for appearance, which is sort of the visual aspect of the organ of the document and whether or not it enhances the message. Um, the book calls that one design. I don't like that title because I feel like it's all design. It's just that some design happens to be visual, and uh, that's what the fourth point refers to. Let's talk about editing for content. I'm going to be using an example in a second that illustrates these three aspects of the message. The purpose of the email I'll show you is, is to get an extension on an assignment deadline. The audience is the professor, in this case me. The medium, like I said, is an email. This is essentially an email that a student sent me in order to request a deadline on the final exam, a deadline extension on the final exam. Well, let's take a look at it for these four C's of content. Is it clear? Is it complete? Is it correct? And is it compelling? You've seen these before. We've already talked about them, so I won't elaborate anymore. But let's see how well they did. Uh, this is the email I received. This is from a few years ago. None of you know this person. But, uh, you know, I want you to pause the video for a moment, read this, and then come back and let's see how clear, complete, correct, or compelling it is. Uh, You'll, you'll notice it wasn't all that clear. You'll notice it, it wasn't even complete. It didn't have all the information I needed to make this decision. Um, it, it wasn't correct. There are a lot of mistakes in there. And uh, finally, it wasn't that, all that compelling. In fact, it was kind of whiny. Now, we're not going to re-edit this to fix all those things, but you'll get a chance to do it in class with another document. Um, Let's move on to organization next, though, and we'll still use the email as an example, but you guys have seen this before, too, opening agenda, body, and closing. Every document you create should be organized this way, um, and let's, let's take a look at the email again. 
Well, there's not really, they're not really following the OABC format here. And so let's see if I can rewrite it in a way that makes it better. Um, here it is. Go ahead and pause the video again and let me know what you think. Okay, so I've rewritten it. You'll notice I have an opening that's much more to the point. I need an extension. Um, it gives me an agenda saying here I'm now going to explain my request. I didn't edit the reasons, but you know, you can assume what those are. And then I have a much better closing where it's it's more respectful, more to the point. Um, it doesn't take much to do this. This Re-editing this with an OABC took me maybe five minutes. And so make sure you're attentive to those aspects of your message that involve organization because they're part of the message itself. Okay, now talking about readability. Um, you know, read, editing for readability for things like grammar, punctuation, clarity of sentences, that, that, that's what I would actually call proofreading, right? Where, where you're, you're assessing it based on more technical detail, and it requires an attention to detail to do that right. Um, really, everything you write from emails up should get a proofreading pass. Um, even then, you're not going to catch everything the first time, but you catch a lot that will help you do it better. Let's go back to that student email. Um, you'll notice uh, if you do a proofreading pass through this email, you'll notice some of the things I noticed. This is not exhaustive, but there are missing commas. He misspelled chalk. He misspelled until. Maybe he meant the word till, but if he was using that, he should have used an apostrophe to abbreviate it, and that's kind of a weird thing to include. You'd see that in, in old hymns. You don't see that in emails to professors. Um, you know, he used the passive voice that would be... Uh, that would be most appreciated rather than saying, I would appreciate it. Um, and he also misconjugated a verb later at the bottom. You see, he says, most of us has worked. It should have been most of us have worked. So, you know, this doesn't help him. Like having all these errors just tells me that not only does is he not planning things well, but he's not even taking the time to edit his email for, for grammar and spelling. Lastly, you know, you'll edit for appearance. Appearance matters. Appearance affects how the document is designed, but it comes last in the editing process. First of all, we're not really going to talk about how to edit for appearance because we'll be spending multiple class sessions on appearance, on visual design, but we uh, I need to emphasize that this comes last. The reason this is the last way you edit is because you got to get content right. The way you design a document visually is entirely based on the content of the document. And if you don't have the content figured out, but you're spending time figuring out what font to use, then you're getting ahead of yourself. You really just need to write it well, and then you can worry about the font later. The reason that matters is because all visual design should be based on the content itself. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into this more as, we, as the semester goes on. Let's talk briefly about editing tools. Um, you know, we talked about the fact that most editing today is done electronically. You can edit on paper. Sometimes people will hand you a printed document. Um, editing, the proofreader's marks are in the book if you ever need to learn them. But what I want you to know is how to do track changes in Word and how to do annotations in Adobe Reader. For Word, this is anytime you're editing Word documents. A lot of people have Word. Most people have Microsoft Word on their computers. The track changes feature is very powerful. And it's a great way to give people detailed feedback on the things that they write. You'll get a lot of PDFs, though, and you can't use Word for track changes on PDFs. And so when you do that, you can use the annotations feature in Adobe Reader. Um, this is software that's free, so you can have it on any computer, Mac, or PC. And when, you use the, and when you use this software, you can add annotations, you can strike through text, you can highlight stuff, you can add in comments and all kinds of things. And so these are the two tools that I recommend you become good at when it, when it comes to electronic versions of editing. Um, I'm not going to teach you how to do this, though, because there are other people who have already done it and that better than me out on the internet. And so what I did is I went and found what I thought were some pretty good videos that introduce you to these tools. Um, really, they're tools you should just go play around with. That's the easiest way to become familiar with them. But check Canvas for links to those tutorials. And I have ver I have I found tutorials both for the Mac and PC versions of, the, of those two software products. OK, let's wrap it up with some other editing tips. Um, first of all, time makes writing better, so make time your friend. Um, you should plan editing time into every document deadline. 
college creates this unfortunate habit, which is writing things the night before they're due, or even in an hour before they're due. The problem is you don't build in time for rewriting. You know, that might be okay at school because it might be the difference between an A or a B, but in your professional careers, it's the difference between a promotion or not. It's the difference between getting laid off or not. You should make sure that the stuff you're writing gets edited before it goes out. Whether it's you editing it or someone else, you need to make sure you take that time but it takes time. For example, if you're going to edit it yourself, one really great thing to do is to separate yourself from what you wrote for at least an hour, preferably a day. What happens is when you write, you sort of get a voice built up in your head that is brought out in the writing. If you step away from your document for a little while, the voice goes away. And then when you come back to what, you're reading, what you've written, you reread it without the dominant voice that's already talking in your head. And you hear the words differently as you read them. And it's a way to make sure that this is easy for somebody else to understand who's not in your head at the time you're writing it. And of course, if you're going to ask somebody else to edit, you need to give them time to edit it too. You don't ever go to somebody and say, hey, I have a half an hour to hand this into my boss. Can you run through it? Because people have stuff to do. They have tasks that they're working on. You can't make your lack of planning somebody else's emergency. So make time your friend because time makes writing better. Secondly, prefer brevity. Shorter sentences and smaller words usually communicate best. You know, um, you go through college and, and high school, too, and it's this sort of you build up this school instilled urge to fill papers with fluff because for some reason you learn that fluff is engaging when in reality fluff is just distracting. You're not writing a mattress. You're not writing a pillow. You're writing a tool for somebody to make decisions. And to the extent that's true, you should be decluttering, getting rid of the fluff, prefer brevity in your writing. Finally, focus as you edit. When you're going back through something, you know, we talked about this earlier, make sure you focus on what you're editing. You're editing for content, you're editing for organization, you're editing for readability, or you're editing for visual appearance. But focus on those things each time you edit rather than all of them at once. If you try to do all of those at once, you won't be very good at editing. So make sure that you're focusing on the purpose of your edit as you do it and you will do a great job. So I encourage you all this semester, if you don't already have habits of editing things thoroughly before you turn them in, take the time to do that. It means setting a deadline for yourself on, on an assignment that's a day earlier than the professor's deadline. But trust me, in the long run, it will be worth it. Thanks.